In the spring of 1945, American forces were gearing up for the big offensive in the Po Valley of Italy. Along with ground forces, the big offensive would require a relentless effort from the United States Army Air Force to disrupt the German exodus of Italy. Thus, the 414th Night Fighter Squadron was running various sorties out of Pontadero Airdrome. On April 22, 1945, four days before the Italian liberation, a young pilot from Texas, 2nd Lieutenant Frank F. Weaver, flew wingman for an afternoon mission over the Po Valley. He never made it home. 66 years later, his sister, Kay Peters, yearns to know the brother she can barely remember. And if not for a series of serendipitous circumstances, Frank Weaver might forever remain a vague memory. Sonny was named Frank Jr. And instead of having two Franks in the family, they gave him a nickname and it was Sonny. Uh, on occasion, he was called Bubba, which is, you know, brother. But uh, it was Sonny for as long as I remember and that's the only way I think of him. Sonny was 14 when I was born, so I have very few memories of him as a child, uh, when I was a child. But I do remember that he taught me to swim at the Highland Park pool. So every time we got out of the swimming pool after my swim, he gave me a piece of double bubble bubble gum, which seemed enormous at the time, actually. It was a real mouthful. They seem smaller now. but. Every time I smell bubble gum, I think of him. Sonny went to North Dallas High School. I actually don't remember my parents ever talking about what kind of a student Sonny was, but everything he did was perfect. He was the only son of three children and uh, could do no wrong, so I'm sure he was an excellent student. Then he went off to A&M when I was still very young. I remember letters home. I remember everybody talking about him. He was a saint uh, in the eyes of the family, of course. He was at A&M for two years and then went to, uh, into training about 18. They gave them uh, students credit for two years of college. So he had a degree from A&M and graduated, in quotes, as a second lieutenant. I guess I never missed what I never knew or was exposed to about my brother. He just simply was not brought up in conversation. I don't remember ever hearing my grandparents speak of Sonny. I don't remember ever hearing Martha, his other sister, speak of him. And maybe it was because it just made them so sad that they just didn't want to talk about it. But it was kind of in my parents' nature to avoid any unpleasantness or something that they weren't comfortable with, so I guess it fits. There were a few pictures of Sonny around the house, and the medals that he won or, or was awarded were framed in, in the house. But he was a part of another life, um, a part of my parents' life in a way. All Kay knew was that Sonny was a pilot going off to war. Until one day something happened. A year or so after my sister died, she was two years older than Sonny, her son and daughter were going through my sister's things and discovered in a bottom drawer of a chest all of Sonny's letters home along with maps showing exactly where in Italy Sonny's plane went down. This was something I had never heard before. I knew he went down in Northern Italy. In fact, Charles and I had been in Italy 
all over Europe with a car, with no agenda, no schedule, and right there in the area where the crash occurred. And we never knew about it, never knew where it was located. So it never occurred to us to look or contact anybody. And I watched Kay uh, start trying to uh, sort them out. I went to the store and bought her 200 glassine binders so she could save this library of the history of her brother. It was exciting to receive those letters because I never knew anything about them. There was one to me. I hope you're enjoying school. How's it going? Have you kept up your swimming? That kind of thing. But most of them were to my parents. And it was a delight to go through those letters and get to know my brother that I had really never known. The letters revealed a timeline of Frank's progression from a young student at Texas A&M through two years of flight training across the wartime United States. Hi Pops, gosh, this is some life. Everything has changed. It is hard as heck, but it is a lot of fun. The minute we got here, we started signing our life away. Today we had eight hours of classification tests. 13 days from today, we will know how I've been classified as pilot, bombardier, or navigator. Sure hope I pass pilot. Today the Weaver family has acquired a pilot. Glorified taxi drivers they call us. How about that? All our cadet clothes were issued us today and they are really keen. We practice shooting 45 automatics and Thompson machine guns. Another comment that he made in one of the letters which was really tragic was Pop when that's what he called my dad, tell mother to quit worrying I am not coming home from this war in a pine box. Time passes mighty fast. We only have two or three weeks left in pre-flight. Tomorrow we go to the pressure chamber to see about what type of ships we will be able to fly. You have to be able to go up to 18,000 feet without oxygen to fly any ship. Dear Mr. and Mrs. W, well, today is graduation day. It is certain we are going to Wickenburg, Arizona. The orders came through today. We start flying tomorrow. We fly a 220 horsepower Stearman made by Boeing. I am now in primary, in which we stay nine weeks. We fly a primary trainer, PT, for 60 hours. Then we go to basic and fly BTs for nine weeks. Then we go to advanced and fly ATs for another nine weeks. Then we get our wings in commission and go to OTU, Operational Training Unit for Overseas Fighting. He enjoyed his training. He would talk about, I flew this plane, or I flew that plane, and I met this guy, or we, a bunch of us went up to Salt Lake City and had blind dates and had fun. Uh, it just seemed like a really neat all-American guy. I did my first solo spin yesterday. It was duck soup. I now have 29 hours and 43 minutes with 101 landings. I flew my first ride formation today. I have never been so close to another plane in all my many flying days. I did my first solo slow roll today in a BT. It's the best slow roll I have ever done. I have 32 hours and 45 minutes now and it's growing all the time. I wish you could see me in my flying garb someday. I look just like a teddy bear. I have a fuzzy hat to wear now. Really neat. Had to scrape ice off the wings before I could fly this morning. Great life if you don't weaken. Now in the letters, Sonny did express how much fun he was having flying with, in training, what he was flying, how many hours he flew that kind of thing, and wanted to buy an airplane when he came home. This last week my flying has been terrible. I mean, I couldn't do anything right. My instrument rides were getting so sad it looked as if I hadn't had any previous time at all. You can expect a day or so of bad flying, but never a whole week of it. Amazing as it may seem to both of you, and to me, I am now an underclassman in advanced. In a few weeks, will be divided into fighter and standard squadrons. Naturally, I want day fighter, then combat. I hope I can get it. 
Here's the latest news. Your ever-loving son has been yanked from a fighter squadron and slapped into a standard squadron. There's a slim chance I might get changed back to fighter later, but so slim. I guess you realize your son has been in the army a year and two days today. I'm getting to be an old hand at this army life. Today I flew four hours and 20 minutes in a B-25. From here I will go to a night fighter transition school to get training in a P-70 or a P-61, the newest plane out, which should prove quite amusing. We will fly the P-61 in combat. It is faster than grease lightning. It's a twin engine aircraft. It's the first aircraft that was designed from scratch to be a night fighter. It had five different radar components. Looking forward, looking back, looking down, speed, altitude. It was a real small airship. It was not only the first airframe to be uh, purpose built as a night fighter, it was the largest plane of World War II that we built to, to be called a fighter. About the P-61, it's kept so secret, I don't know much about it myself. I do know that it has two 2,000 horsepower Pratt Whitney engines in it, and it redlines at 400 miles per hour. It also carries enough firepower to sink a ship. No kidding. Flying is a great thing. Anyone can do it, and you have no idea of the fun you can have. You get a different outlook on all kinds of things. A girl uh, that had gotten married, he, got, he thought she was kind of a girlfriend that he would see when he came home but uh, she got married while he was there. And he said, nobody can do that to me twice. Dear folks, I am one very happy fellow. Today your ever-loving son flew a P-61 Black Death all by his lonesome. I don't believe I've ever waited so long to check out of any ship or wanted to as much. The sign reads, combat in 38 days. On the same day, Sonny soloed the P-61. Frank Sr. wrote a Christmas letter to his son. Merry Christmas to you, man. I have a sad feeling you will not be here on Christmas Day. True, Christmas is in a man's heart and mind, and at home or abroad it can be a very happy day. That is just what I wish for you, son. In the course of the letter, Stan Kalan, Sonny's recently appointed RO, is mentioned for the first time in the form of a question. What rank is your radar operator? My RO, Stan, is a flight officer. You remember I said it is one rank below a second lieutenant, although he makes as much as I do per month. He enlisted in 1943, um, as soon as he graduated high school. Two months later, at age 20, Frank Weaver was ready for duty in the European theater against Germany. He would get his dream assignment, to fly the Northrop P-61 night fighter, dubbed the Black Widow. Dear folks, just a note to let you know that your ever-loving son is safe and sound in sunny Italy. I still can't picture myself being over here at last. I am sleeping in tents that are cold as blazes. We were issued sleeping sacks and sleep on army cots. The food here is fine and I feel I shall gain some weight. Something I would have liked to have known from the letters that Sonny wrote, perhaps in retrospect, would be how he felt about the war, uh, where they were. We knew he was in Italy. We did know that much. Had no idea where. Didn't know anything about what they were doing. And of course, they couldn't talk about that, I suppose. The fellows here in the squadron are really fine. There is swell a bunch as I'd want to meet anywhere. We are living in an Italian villa, which is the cat spats, no less. As far as the living quarters we had there, we were in great shape. We lived in a professor's house, home, and he still lived there too. He, had an, he and his wife had an apartment with, I think, five rooms, and we had all the officers, uh, flying officers, were all based in that same house and they weren't crowded either. Dear folks, well, it's been one year and a day since that Sunday morning last year that I got my commission in wings at Luke. 
Stan and I are still together right now. As I am writing this, we are sitting in operations down on the lines, standing on alert. We fly a patrol of the lines just to keep the Huns from getting any ideas. You should see my leather jacket now. It's a work of art. I have a large cloth squadron patch on the left front below my name tag, a picture of the plane painted on the back, and a leather Texas flag sewn on the right shoulder. How fine. There was never, to my knowledge, any talk of his coming home. The war was nearly over. He'll be home soon. There was none of that to my, to my knowledge. There's nothing much to report. You may have read in the newspapers that American night fighters are intruding in the Po Valley of Italy. I'm waiting to go up now, sweating out the weather. President Roosevelt's death came as quite a blow and just at the time when things over here were going so well. Landed from the patrol just a few minutes ago. Watching the war from three miles in the air is quite a sensation, also very beautiful. No other letters came from Sonny after April 15th, but his older sister Martha kept writing. Dearest Sonny, we were all sad about the president's death. It worried me so for a while. I was afraid the end of the war would be put off, but I heard Truman's speech this morning, and I believe he'll carry on. The campaign in Italy was going well for the Allies. The relentless American attack, both on the ground and in the air, were forcing the Germans to pull back. I had just gotten back from Belgium about that time, and uh, when they started to break through in the Po Valley, so. I went back right to flying in, and then a lot of the people there, I hardly knew anybody when I got back there. On the morning of April 22, 1945, the 414th Night Fighter Squadron CO was told they'd be flying a mission during the day, something that they had never done before, to apply maximum pressure on German ground troops scrambling out of Italy. Yes, it was highly unusual because the Germans were being pushed back real fast. If there was a German there and you could identify it, you were free to shoot it. So that left the two night fighter squadrons, they were both set up to go and fly during the daytime missions, which was no, not a big deal, but it was just a change in doing things. It was on that day Sonny Weaver met Captain Jenkins for the first time. He didn't know my brother. They just were assigned to go on this flight at the same time, and it was okay, and how do you do? I'm Joe, I'm Sonny, I'm Frank, and that was it. They got in their planes and off they went. You probably walk out to the airplanes and you say something to the guy, well, you do what I tell you to do today, and you stay on my wing and we'll get along on this thing just fine. So everybody just went out, got your parachute, crawled in the airplane, that was it. There was no great big talk about how you were gonna do anything. As far as the CO, he said, well, just you do what this captain tells you to do. That's more or less, that was about all that was said of that. The CO uh, we had was uh, Rip Bollinger. And he was somebody that was liked by everybody. It didn't take you long for you getting some squadron to your ear, boy, this is an iron butted so and so, you know, and that didn't take long for it to filter down to the whole business. Once airborne, the two P-61s headed up the Po Valley. It was a safe airplane. It wasn't really hard to fly as far as I was concerned. It was supposed to be very maneuverable, which it was. I could get in a fighter pattern with P-38s and I could turn just as tight as they could. We did quite a bit of bombing work with it and uh, we did quite a bit of intruder and regular nighttime work with it. We had cluster bombs on, which once you dropped them, they had a little propeller on the front and it'd spin and it'd open it up and then they'd drop small bombs all over everything. Those both worked, uh, they were effective. The Po Valley and the Po River was probably 50 miles across. 
We had probably just crossed into the Po Valley. And about that time is when we saw this group of trees, which I would say it was 30, good 30 acres, maybe 40. In that group of trees, Jenkins and Weaver spotted German transport vehicles. We made one turn and went back, called him and said, well, we'll make one pass through here. We made one pass, I dropped the cluster bombs and so did he. Then he said, well, I spotted some people, so I'm gonna make a turn and go back. I said, don't do it. So I called him twice and told him don't do it. Well, he said, well, I'm going back. I didn't say no more. You get enthused in something like that, and you say, well, one more time, I, I can do something here. Well, yes, you can, most of the time, but there's times you can't. They're sitting there ready, waiting for you now. And that he recalls that there was flak that they took from the ground, and that as part of that, that the uh, one of the booms on the, the plane got hit, and he remembers looking out and seeing that there were flames and that it was, it was more or less destroyed on the one boom. I made a turn, turned back because I saw or heard where he was hit. Uh, pictures of the construction of that aircraft at that particular area, both wheel wells, there are six oxygen tanks. Well, that's where the plane was hit and uh, Kalan says that there was an immediate uh, fire. Uh, the, it, it was just a matter of perhaps eight feet from where his post was in the aircraft, so he got a full view of it. I don't know what it was exactly. Probably was, it could have been 20 millimeter or something like that. Of course, we couldn't see it, it would be in, that was in, being as in woodland. The first thing we knew about it, that it was hit. The radar operator in the back said there's smoke coming off of him. So I pulled in fairly close to him, and by the end, the tail boom on the right-hand side had burned off. The rudder was still standing up. One engine was more or less feathered, and the gear, uh, gear on the right side was hanging part way out. Well, I called him a couple times on the radio and I couldn't raise him. He did talk about trying to communicate with Frank and there was no communication with Frank, that the lines had been severed. Uh, or he wasn't even sure if you know Frank was still alive at that point, but he just assumed that communication lines had been severed. So I pulled in fairly close to him, pulled my parachute harness up and pulled it and pointed down. He said, uh-uh. The lines were back that way, maybe 20 miles. It might have been a little less, I don't know. But that's what he was trying for. You're sitting there with shoulder harness on and a parachute on. He's probably jumping around some, but uh, he's strapped down, he ain't going nowhere. I could sit there and I could watch the tail boom. The rudder across was supporting it and the boom on the left side was all that was important. The right side was burnt out. Well, it was just kind of flopping back and forth, but it was still in contact at that time. You know it's gonna break for long. That's why I was trying to persuade him to get out of it. And so he, he knew he needed to uh, eject from the plane and his hatch was um, difficult to open. It's fairly easy to get out for the simple reason that what you do, you drop the gear, of course the gear is already out. You drop the gear and you pop the back of your seat and you can go right out through the hole, right down where the landing gear or the nose gear come out of. Hydraulic lines lost pressure. The right main was hanging and the nose gear was also hanging. He couldn't see behind him at all. It made me feel better to a degree to know that there was an escape hatch because before it had sounded like there was no earthly way he could have ever gotten out of that plane. What he was wanting to do, and you can't blame him, he was wanting that 15 or 20 miles to the Allied lines. That's, he'd have bailed out when he got there. But things didn't just didn't work out that way. Not long after we found the maps and realized where Sonny crashed in Italy, our daughter and son-in-law planned a trip to Italy. 
and the maps were fresh enough in our memory that we thought, oh, they might be in the area where Sonny went down. How interesting would that be? So I went online and I just went, I went to Google and entered the word Regiola, Italy. And here it comes up and there are several listings there and I pick up uh, two websites. As luck would have it, this site that I sent this, this pig in a poke, shot in the dark letter to Italy, winds up in the restaurant whose manager turns it over to his owner, who happens to be one of the now witnesses of the crash. A gentleman there had knowledge of several people who were children when the plane went down. Who then in turn turns the English inquiry over to somebody who could read it, namely the local historian of the town, Franco Parmigiani. It was so amazing to find out that Franco Parmigiani, through his work as a historian for the town of Reggiolo, Italy, had researched Frank Weaver, who knew some information about him, but obviously not the whole story, and was interested enough to put it in a book and then to pursue more information once he received a communique that his family was interested in finding people who had witnessed the crash during World War II. And Franco asked for more information about Sonny. He asked for his birth date. He asked his full name and his rank. So Charles sent back that information. Franco reviews it, gets it translated, sits down with the mayor, Mayor Barbara Bernadelli, and they think, my goodness, our celebration is coming up on April the 25th. Let's put something together. Now, this is just apparently what happened. We were very surprised to receive then from Franco a newspaper clipping that was about Sonny and the crash, and to him they were, he was quite the hero uh, to have avoided the village and crash in the field and didn't kill anyone there in the village. But to our surprise, the village and the mayor had arranged for a plaque, a bronze plaque, to be placed on the side of the castle in the middle of the village next to a huge marble plaque that commemorates the villagers that were killed in the war. They even had a band that had old men and young men all together, but it was quite a, a celebration and the mayor spoke and took the flag down, the Italian flag down from over the brass plaque to unveil it. And it was quite a ceremony and we were really pleased and surprised. Franco requested that we send him a photo of Frank's memorial plaque here in Dallas. So we did some research and found that one of the flowers of Italy is a white rose. So we took a bouquet of yellow roses of Texas and white roses for Italy, decorated Sonny's plaque at Sparkman Hillcrest. Kay and Charles had found an Italian flag and an American flag and we took photos of it and sent wonderful pictures. We discussed with them how the yellow rose stood for Texas and the white rose for Italy and how we wanted to create a union, if not between the state and the country, between our families at least. That certainly increased our interest in Shannon and Alan's trip to Italy because if these folks were so appreciative, then it could be a wonderful opportunity to speak in person with some of them. This was a, a person from my mother's family who we knew so little about. And because the people in Rajolo were so very interested, we had to go and close in the loose ends 
on the story. We did not know what to expect when we arrived in Rajolo. We didn't realize how welcoming they were going to be, calling us into their home for wonderful meals with the mayor of the town even, who was delightful. After lunch, Franco actually had a surprise up his sleeve. He had not told us that we were actually going to meet eyewitnesses of the crash on the crash site as each of the bambinos, as we call them, since they were between 10 and 13 at the time of the crash, told their individual stories and Marco Parmigiani translated. The, the, the fire of the cannons that were trying to beat these, uh, to, to hit the planes. In one moment, one of these planes, this one, was hit by, uh, by fire. And you see the, the explosion in the, in the sky. The fire was getting pretty hot on the RO in the back. So he pulled a, a pin for the escape hatch. Well, it didn't come out right then. Well, he got real interested in getting it out then. He, he described it as the latch, and I think he talked about kicking it with his legs to make it open. So he jumped on it. Well, it came out. He caught himself with his arms on both sides. Well, he was out clear up to here. Well, that wasn't gonna last too long. He fell out then. He pulled a parachute and uh, I think they picked him up in a couple weeks. And he began to go down, go down, go down. And yes, till he reached the, the ground when he was, was so close. Uh, well, he was already on fire, as, as I already said. They witnessed the plane actually go down in the field across the road. Normally, we went out one airplane by ourselves, and that's the way we went. And the decisions you made was what your neck hung on. But he was trying to, to keep far from, uh, from the, the buildings, from the Yes, from the, the people who lived here. He was trying to move the plane to keep safe the people who was living here. Osana Andreoli was seven at the time. She lived in a house across the gravel road, a rather large structure that had a, um, a lightning rod out the top, similar to an antenna. 20, sono andata a controllare, 22 aprile, 22 aprile. il mio compleanno. It was on the 22 of ecco, April? Ecco, primo sette anni. It was the her birthday. E her una birthday. giornata che era molto ventosa. It was a very windy molto day. In her home at the time of the crash were 13 children because the German occupation had actually taken over homes in the town. So several families lived with Osana's family. Noi bambini praticamente abbiamo visto questo aereo che stava per arrivare già con le fiamme eccetera correvamo dentro al rifugio with, the, with the, these children that they were playing the children were playing together they were seen the, the plane was burning is falling down when she see that the plane which was burning fall down on the ground she noticed that the man with, which was up on the plane was trying to come out and she, she has seen a leg of him outside the plane but he didn't have the time to open it and so he remained on the plane which was, which was flamed, which was on fire. You don't see an airplane. I mean, there's just a big ball of fire, that's all. Lino Paniza was older than Osana at that time his father was the farmer who owned the land on which the plane crashed. The, the plane crashed in two parts. Uh, the front part fell in the property of this father's man. And as he explained, his father, when everything was removed, put a, a, a tree 
on this place as a remembrance of these men who died on this ground. Told us their individual stories in very, in a very heartwarming way. These men here um, have seen the man, have seen the corpse in the plane. He, he went there to try to to, in, to intervene, to make something. He followed the strings of, of the parachute to reach the body, and uh, well, it was it was burned. It was uh, it was impossible to recognize him. And this man was one of, of those who, when before he was brought to the cemetery, who tried to put together these remains. He was nine years old. They were all such marvelous townspeople and so highly emotional about their experiences. It was as if our being there and listening to their stories brought them closure on what had happened so long ago. They were the, the, the son, the children of the farmers right. that were playing in the fields. So when they see it, well, it was, I think, a very, very great fear. Sorry. <laughs> it's so hard for a child to be able to deal with a catastrophe of that magnitude. It's a great honor for us that you tried to care for our people. We thank you. It was as if they could put to rest this young man who suffered for them, knowing that he had family back in the States that knew of them and how they tried to help him and knew that we cared about their stories. In this same field, more than six decades later, the witnesses gather to remember an American pilot they never knew, but could never forget. So he, he almost touched the, the, the roof of the building. That must have been scary. When the plane flew over, striking the lightning rod on her house. Where you see the sign on the, which the red yes. stripe, that was the point where the plane crashed down. The townspeople took the plane pieces and hid them, buried them close by. And later, the townspeople came back to the wreckage and would take nuts and bolts and pieces so that they could mend their own farm equipment. So they actually continued to have pieces of, of Frank's plane there in the town in their own equipment. We did not know what to expect when we arrived in Rajolo. We had no idea that they were going to be so warm and welcoming. However, the plaque of Frank's next to it had a newly planted yellow rose bush underneath it with blooms already. To see the videos and witness the, the emotion and the gratitude that those folks expressed was overwhelming. Well, those, those were clearly big-hearted people that had great, you know, uh, positive thoughts of what Frank did and probably for, you know, just the allied resources coming through and, and to eliminate the threats that they'd been under with the Germans. Three days after Sonny's death, Italy was free from German rule. Yet the Weaver family still had not heard the tragic news. Your letter is late this week, too. Maybe because of your rest. Much love, Marty. Dearest Sonny, we haven't heard from you in two weeks, but we suppose you're being moved, so we aren't worried too much. The day after Martha's last letter, 16 days after Sonny's death, the dreaded telegram arrived. I was out in front uh, of the house playing with friends when my sister and her husband drove up quickly, stopped quickly. She got out of the car and ran past me crying and into the house. 
So I went in to see what was going on. And that's the first time, and the only time I suppose, that I ever saw my father cry. But clearly something was wrong and they just said that Sonny had been killed. Five days after Sonny's death, condolence letters were being drafted. This one from Sonny's CO, Lieutenant Colonel Bolander, who along with details of the crash, added personal observations about Sonny. Their ship was disabled by intense, heavy enemy flak, but your son maintained control until his observer bailed out. It is believed that your son was killed instantly and could not have suffered either physical or mental anguish. His ability to turn a dull moment into a laugh with his caricatures of night fighter squadron life made him one of our most popular officers. A month later, Brigadier General Charles T. Myers of the 12th Air Force wrote to Frank Sr. Dear Mr. Weaver, I wish to add my tribute to your son, 2nd Lieutenant Frank Weaver, Jr., whose gallantry in action has won the posthumous award of the Silver Star. Mere words are insufficient solace, but I hope that this recognition of your son's heroic conduct will in some way help to alleviate the burden. More letters came from farther up the line of command, even from President Truman, but none could console the grief-stricken family. Frank Sr. was hit particularly hard and wrote words that spoke for a nation in grief for all the sons lost to the war. I killed my son. Yes, just as truly as though I had manned the anti-aircraft gun that shot him from the skies. And so did many thousands of American fathers and mothers. Think, America! And God grant that the fathers and mothers of another generation may never stand bewildered and stunned, striving through tears to read the blurring words on a bit of yellow paper while thinking in their mind of minds, I killed my son. Lieutenant Colonel Bolander wrote to Frank Sr. again with more details. Frank was given a formal burial ceremony in a picturesque cemetery nearby. Your son was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry in action. He is the only member of the 414th to be so honored. The Silver Star is an award of even higher category than the famous Distinguished Flying Cross. Frank Sr. continued to write to Sonny's CO, hoping to understand how and why this could happen. But Frank Sr. yearned for something those letters couldn't provide. He wanted to be close to his son again. So he reached out to the last man with Sonny, the one who survived, his friend, Stanley Kalan. Stan, it would give us great pleasure to have you come to Dallas and spend some time with us. Now, there are many things that we would like to know that only you can tell us. If he had come back to us, there would be many questions we would ask him. It is those questions largely we would now like to ask of you. Frank was trying to fly the ship back, or at least cross the lines. I could not help admiring the courage and the coolness that he displayed that day. I hope to visit Dallas in the near future to clear up the questions you have in mind. Sincerely, Stan. The fine line of me existing and you existing as, you know, my kids is so narrow because it's only because that plane kept flying that my dad could get out. And my, the rest of the generation could have been gone, you know, that came out of it. I think Sonny made a second round uh, of firing at the retreating Germans because it was a job he was supposed to do and he was going to do it. And I think he was a cowboy. I think he was young and invincible and he'd show them. I had secured three hardback books about this aircraft and its history. And in two of those books was a picture of a man named Joe Jenkins next to his Black Widow aircraft. Charles said that uh, there was to be a World War II reunion. It's an annual thing that happens in Reading, Pennsylvania at a flight museum there and that he bet that Joe Jenkins would be there because he lives pretty close.
Watching and listening to Joe Jenkins was a, an experience in itself. 95 years old, he drove himself and his son from Delaware to Pennsylvania for this show. And he's just as spry as he can be. Uh, he kind of fills us in on how, what he, his experience with, um, with the mission and told us some things we weren't aware of about what, what happened. He was incredible and his memory was amazing. I guess you experience something like that, I guess it's etched in your memory forever and you never forget. What did I think of Joe Jenkins? Uh, I'm glad he's on our team. <laughs> we knew nothing about Frank before any of these events began. Now we have filled in chapters of life that we had no clue were out there. My mother knows more about her brother. A town in another country knows more about the family attached to someone who was helping them to find their freedom. We have a bigger picture, which is, again, actually brought the world into a very small scope. And through Frank and his death, have found us friends a new family in another part of the world. I'd have liked to have had a big brother and, and been close to him. And uh, I very much uh, miss that experience, but I think we need to appreciate what those guys are going through and what they're doing to keep us free, that, uh, that their contribution is huge and they need to be appreciated and honored for that, no matter when they served or where. You would probably hope that civilization would have enough sense not to get another war going, not of the magnitude that we saw in World War II. That would be the ideal, I think. <laughs>